For nearly 30 years, there was a missing piece of the interstate highway system, not because engineers couldn't build, but because in one narrow canyon in western Colorado, the usual way of building highways was no longer acceptable. When planners first looked at Glenwood Canyon, they saw a familiar problem with a familiar solution. Blast the rock, push the river aside, and run four lanes straight through. But places like this are rare. Landscapes of this scale and beauty don't survive by accident. This time, people stood in the way. Environmental groups, local communities, and federal law stopped the project cold, forcing engineers to choose between abandoning the route entirely or reinventing how an interstate could be built. What finally emerged here wasn't just a road through a canyon, it was a new model for highway engineering in America. Today, we look at the story of I-70 through Glenwood, Colorado, in a series we call Engineering the Impossible, as we go beyond the exit. Well, I want to welcome everyone. My name is Scott, and you're watching Beyond the Exit, a place where we love telling the stories of the roads that move us. Today's road is a special one, Glenwood Canyon, an engineering marvel that actually changed the way we look at building roads in our country. So now let's get on with our story. The Missing Link When the interstate highway system was laid out in the 1950s, the goal was clear. Connect the country with continuous high-speed routes that could move people, goods, and military traffic reliably year-round. By the 1960s, most of that vision was already in place. Interstate 70 crossed the plains, climbed the Colorado Front Range, and passed under the Continental Divide through the Eisenhower Tunnel. West of there, it pointed toward Utah. But one gap in this high-speed highway remained. Between the high desert of eastern Utah and the mountains west of Denver, a 12-mile stretch carved by the Colorado River resisted easy solutions. This was Glenwood Canyon, and while it looked like a simple connection on a map, the corridor was already tightly constrained. Long before the interstate, the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad had threaded its way through the canyon along the river. Later came US Route 6, a two-lane highway squeezed into whatever space remained between the rock, water, and rail. US 6 functioned, but only just. The road wound tightly through the canyon, leaving little margin for error. As traffic and the size of the vehicles coming through, including large freight, what had once been adequate became increasingly fragile. By the time planners looked west from Eisenhower Tunnel, it was clear that US-6 could never be widened to an interstate, and leaving a break in I-70 wasn't an option. From a transportation standpoint, the conclusion seemed unavoidable. A modern highway had to pass through Glenwood Canyon. A New Era For decades, highway construction followed a familiar formula. If the land was in the way, you reshaped it. Mountains were blasted, rivers were redirected, and valleys were filled until the road fit the plan. That approach had built most of the interstate highway system, and at first, Glenwood Canyon was treated no differently. Early concepts called for cutting into the canyon walls, straightening sections of the river, and forcing a four-lane highway through the narrowest part of the corridor. But by the time those ideas surfaced, the country had changed. You see, this wasn't an empty canyon. People hiked here, they fished the Colorado River, others rafted through the gorge, riding the current between sheer rock walls. Glenwood Canyon wasn't just scenery, it was a rare place people knew, used, and valued. Beginning in 1970, planners evaluated alternate corridors north and south of the canyon, but moving the highway out of the gorge meant longer alignments, harsher terrain, and significantly higher cost with no clear transportation benefit. By 1972, planners concluded that the canyon route, difficult as it was, caused the least overall damage. And what those planners weren't ready for was a cultural collision. The question wasn't whether the road was needed, it was whether a place like this was worth preserving as more than an obstacle to be removed. In other words, the old playbook wasn't going to work here, but for the government, walking away wasn't either. So, if Interstate 70 was going to pass through Glenwood Canyon, it would have to be built under a new set of expectations, one that demanded the road adapt to the landscape, not the other way around. A new way to build a road. 
In Glenwood Canyon, it became painfully obvious to everyone involved that something different had happened. Instead of forcing a solution onto the landscape, planners were pushed toward an idea that was still unusual at the time. Bring engineers, environmental groups, and local communities into the same room. Early in the process, before final designs were locked in, the result was the creation of a Citizens Advisory Committee, a forum where conflict wasn't eliminated but managed. Engineers laid out what the highway required, conservationists and residents pushed back on how much land could be disturbed, and for the first time on an interstate project of this scale, design decisions were shaped in public view. What emerged from those conversations was a fundamental shift in approach. Rather than widening the canyon floor, the highway would be lifted above it. Instead of massive embankments, long bridges would carry traffic across sensitive areas. Construction would avoid the river wherever possible, and large sections of roadway would be built without placing heavy equipment directly in the canyon itself. And these weren't small changes. They demanded new construction methods, new sequencing, and new tolerances. And in the end, the road would no longer dominate the landscape. It would coexist with it. Engineering with Restraint Once the decision was made to rethink how the highway would be built, Glenwood Canyon offered almost no room at ground level. The river claimed the center of the way. The railroad occupied one side. Sheer rock walls were on the other. There was no wide bench to build on, no space to stage equipment, and no margin for error. The solution was to stop thinking of the highway as a single surface. Instead of spreading outward, engineers began stacking the roadway vertically. In some sections, eastbound and westbound traffic would run on separate levels, offset from one another and supported by long, elevated structures anchored directly into the canyon walls. This approach reduced the highway's footprint preserved the river corridor, and avoided massive excavation. But it came with a cost. Nothing like this had ever been attempted on an interstate at this scale. To make it work, engineers turned to methods more commonly associated with bridge construction than highway building. Much of the roadway was assembled piece by piece from above, using a massive, self-propelled launching gantry that moved along the top of the piers, placing precast concrete segments without staging equipment on the canyon floor and it allowed construction to proceed while keeping machines out of the river and away from the canyon walls. But in a handful of locations, even these measures weren't enough. At four points along the route, the canyon narrowed to such an extent that continuing in open air would have required unacceptable blasting into the walls. Rather than forcing the alignment, planners chose another form of restraint, short, carefully placed tunnels. Now, these were not long mountain bores like the Eisenhower and Johnson Tunnel. They were not meant to conquer the terrain. They were brief, purpose-built passages, used only when the canyon left no other responsible option. Each tunnel allowed the highway to slip through the most constrained sections while preserving the surrounding rock, sight lines, and natural flow of the canyon. Together, the bridges, stacked roadways, and tunnels formed a single idea. The highway adjusted itself repeatedly, yielding wherever the landscape demanded it. As construction progressed, something else began to change as well. Many people working on the project arrived seeing the canyon as an obstacle to overcome. But day after day, suspended above the river and surrounded by its walls, that mindset began to shift. Decisions were adjusted and alignments were refined. In some cases, construction became harder, not because it had to be, but because it left less of a mark. Now, this, of course, wasn't written into the specifications. It emerged on the job. But what had begun as an engineering challenge gradually became something more deliberate, a project shaped as much by restraint as by capability. The Ongoing Truce When Interstate 70 finally opened through Glenwood Canyon in 1992, it looked almost effortless. Traffic flowed well, the river remained visible, and the road seemed to disappear into the walls around it. But the canyon never stopped being a canyon. Rockfall remained a constant presence. Heavy rain and fire-scarred slopes occasionally sent debris toward the river and the road beside it. Even after construction ended, the forces that shaped the canyon were still very much at work. The highway had been engineered with restraint, but it still existed within a dynamic landscape that could never be fully controlled. 
and for maintenance crews, keeping the roads open meant being fully engaged with what passes through. Clearing rockfalls, stabilizing slopes, repairing drainage, and responding to whatever the terrain delivered next. This wasn't a highway you built once and walked away from. It required attention, judgment, and just a touch of humility. And that's a part of Glenwood Canyon's real legacy. Before this project, highway engineering in America was largely about control, reshaping the terrain until it complied with the road. Glenwood Canyon showed that another approach was possible. Here, engineers worked within limits instead of erasing them, allowing the place itself to shape the solution. The choices made here are still debated today, whether they were worth the cost or not. At roughly $490 million, the Glenwood Canyon project became one of the most expensive stretches of roadway ever built at the time. And yet, standing in the canyon today, it's hard to deride what those choices preserved. In the end, Interstate 70 through Glenwood Canyon didn't conquer the canyon. It learned how to live inside it. Today, as you pass through Glenwood Canyon, the highway draws your eyes at first. It is an impressive piece of engineering. The way it flows and curves and almost blends into the canyon itself. And then without realizing it, your attention shifts away, away from the road and back to the canyon, just the way it was intended to be. Well, we hope you enjoyed our story. Maybe you're a professional driver or just a commuter and you've got a story you want to tell. Well, leave it in the comments below. Also, if you enjoyed the video, if you would, please hit the like button. That helps it go farther on YouTube, and we'd love it if you would share it with someone you think would enjoy it as well. I want to give a special thank you and shout out to Interstate Kyle, who has provided us with all of this 4K driving footage. It means a lot to us to have this extra context. If you would go over and check out some of the content they have, we'll leave a link to one of his videos related to Glenwood Canyon at the end of the video and a link to his channel in our description. You know, we love telling the stories from the roads that move us, and maybe that's something you enjoy too. If so, why don't you join us on this caravan and subscribe to the channel? You know, beyond the exit, we're always looking for history that's just hiding in plain sight. We know you can be other places. We're happy that you're here. We want to say thank you, and God bless.